Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, grade six. We are getting close to the end of our Iroquois Confederacy unit. So far, we have talked about the history of the Iroquois. We've talked about Hiawatha. We've talked about the Great Law of Peace. And we've even talked about the Longhouses. Today, we are going to talk about the actual government of the Iroquois. Now, from our knowledge that we've covered so far, part of what we know about their political arena is that the Iroquois had a high respect for the women. The clan mother was responsible for many different decisions, such as selecting the chiefs, as well as the women were responsible for helping decide if the Iroquois were going to go to war. However, the Iroquois did also have a government, and that government was known as the Grand Council. So today we're going to take a look at the Grand Council with help from a slideshow made by another teacher named Kasha Mastro Domenico. Hey, let's get to it. All right, so when talking about the Grand Council, the first thing we want to do is call back a little bit to our ancient Athens unit, where we also talked about another type of council. If you remember, in ancient Athens, they had something called the Council of 500. And in the Council of 500, of course, they had 500 members or citizens from Athens chosen to lead their council divided amongst the different tribes within Athens. The Grand Council of the Iroquois Confederacy works in a similar format in which we actually have a council where members from the different nations comprise that council. Unlike Athens, however, where they had 500 members, the Grand Council in the Iroquois actually had 50 chiefs, otherwise known as, uh, as Hoyana, that were selected from the nations to represent the council, to represent each nation within that Grand Council. Now, each nation had a different amount of Hoyana in the council. For example, you might notice up here that the Onondaga actually had 14 chiefs that were selected to be part of the Grand Council. That was partly because they were one of the bigger nations. We also look at how the Cayuga had eight, the Mohawk had nine, the Seneca had eight, and the Oneida had nine. And of course, now that the Tuscarora has also joined the Iroquois Confederacy, they would also have had members within there. One important thing to note is that even though the Grand Council had these differing numbers from each nation, each nation still had the same amount of power within. So just because the Onondaga had more members in the Grand Council, it did not mean that they had a bigger say. They still had the same amount of say as the Mohawk, the Cayuga, or any of the other nations. So how was the Grand Council chosen then? How were these chiefs chosen? We know that the clan mother was basically the one responsible for selecting the chiefs. So we'll kind of look into how that ended up becoming part of how the Grand Council was formed. So in each clan, so when we're talking about the clans, of course, remember, we're talking about the clan animals, the beaver clan, the deer clan, and so on. They would have a women's council as well as a men's council. And those two councils would advise the clan mothers. So these clan mothers' job was to take this advice into account and to start to choose and advise the Hoyana or the chiefs. And of course, if we remember, the chiefs were, were selected by looking at these different traits. So they'd be selected by, were they kind-hearted? Did they understand the tradition of the Iroquois? Did they understand what the great law was? Were they fair? Did they understand the importance of family? Could they take criticism? Could they think clearly? Were they honest? All of these were part of what made up the Grand Council and made up the chiefs, and they needed to have these in order to make sure they had a fair representation. Now, with the Grand Council, there are a few other things we need to know. And the first is, how are decisions made within the Grand Council? Well, the Grand Council used something called consensus. And you might remember from earlier in our year, we talked about the idea of consensus as a form of decision making. What consensus means is that everybody involved agrees with the decision. If somebody doesn't agree, then they can't make the decision. We looked at this in, form, in, in the form of courts, where we have a jury in a court system. Right now in Canada, generally about 12 jurors, and they all have to decide if somebody is guilty 
guilty or innocent of a crime. If anybody does not make the same choice as everybody else, then they have to go back and revisit or they have to scrap it altogether. For the Grand Council, they used consensus. So what would happen is if there was a decision that had to be made, they would get together and meet as a council. If the Seneca and Mohawk reached a consensus on a decision, they would now bring it as well to the Cayuga and the Oneida. If they reached a, a consensus, they would then bring it again to the Onondaga. However, if any one of these groups disagreed with the decision, it would have to go back to the beginning again and the process would start over again until all of the different nations agreed. Once all of the nations actually agreed with a decision, that would be when they decided whether they should make that go forward. And that could be on decisions of war, it could be decisions on hunting, decisions on all sorts of different things, treaties between the nations, and all of these things would have been recorded on something called a wampum belt. And a wampum belt, which we'll talk about in, again a little bit later on our next lesson actually, a wampum belt is how they recorded, how the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee recorded any treaty or messages or important decisions that got made. There are basically three major types of decisions they would look at. They would look at peace treaties between the nations, they would look at trade agreements, and they would also look at war. Those were the three major types of decisions that the Grand Council would make. And like we said, the decisions would be recorded on a wampum belt. So there you have it, the Grand Council the Iroquois way of having a full-time government. Um, like Athens and like us, the Grand Council was a big part of democracy there because the people and the chiefs were actually selected to represent the people, which is a big part of what democracy is. It looks a little different than we have today, of course, because we elect our leaders directly, whereas the men and the women in the Iroquois gave advice to the clan mother on who they felt could be the chief and could, who could represent the Grand Council. But that was still their take on democracy, and it is a little bit on how we've modeled some of our form of democracy as well. So that'll be that lesson for today. Next time we're going to go into a little bit about the wampum belt, which will be one of our last lessons in social studies for the year. So until then, still a little bit bearded, a little less, still teaching, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great day.